going to just get uh, jump into it without uh, too much of an introduction if you if you guys don't mind i think the title of the talk is fairly self explanatory but i'll i'll explain the motivation just a little bit more so i obviously i work for exonic uh what we do is a essentially a software stack based on these concepts that i'm uh, that hopefully i'll be able to explain to you today namely cqrs and event sourcing or or es for short uh there's a couple of different ways that i can get to our end goal but the end goal today is really to explain to you a little bit about what exactly these concepts are in particular what these design patterns are when you would go about using them uh and why you would consider axon uh as an implementation uh, technology if you choose to you implement these design patterns so uh the reason i said there's a couple of different ways of getting to this is because i want to start out actually by asking you how which path you would like me to take So one path of accomplishing our goal today is assume uh essentially zero knowledge or near zero knowledge of CQRS and event sourcing uh and explain a bit from the ground up exactly what these patterns are uh and then go into a little bit of axon uh another way of getting to the same path is essentially assuming introductory knowledge of CQRS and event sourcing uh talk a little bit more in depth certainly from an axonic standpoint why these things are important uh and dig a little bit more into the code so at least half of the time uh at at a bare minimum i actually will be spending at least half of the time looking at running code and looking at demos but uh, depending on what you all are uh in terms of the securus event sourcing ecosystem we could do a bit more and i could actually explain a bit more of the code as opposed to doing more of the traditional lecture so let me take a quick poll uh which path do you want to take uh ground up cqrs event sourcing okay that's the majority all right and that's fair uh and actually that this is part of this, that's actually the principal motivation of the talk because that's what we uh, tend to see uh, from an axonic standpoint is uh, a lot of people actually are, are have basic familiarity with these terms they've heard about them on and off but they don't actually understand what these design patterns are and when they are applicable so i think that's a that's a good place to start uh apologies to the folks that are actually do have some uh secure some event sourcing background uh, feel free to catch up with me later uh if you have specific questions about axon or uh, any of those design patterns i'll be happy to uh discuss with you that okay so uh this is what axonic is a uh, very brief uh plug and this actually is changing quite rapidly but our the heart of the company is the axon framework which is what i'll be talking about a, a little bit today Uh, in addition to that we have two different products today uh namely axon hub and axon db uh very briefly speaking axon db is basically a highly specialized event store uh and you'll see in a second what that means uh and axon hub is a way of distributing making this uh secureus es thing and actually making it work in a distributed environment principally in a microservices environment uh, in a way that makes sense for these design patterns want to find out a little bit more about it uh best place is our website I also have a little bit of lit- literature and actually a little bit of swag so those cubes and pens and stickers if uh, if you want some of those please uh, please do uh, take some of those and certainly uh, you know just as a offhand note uh, the business that you guys are talking about logistics and transport transportation that's actually a very good use case for uh, CQRS and yes but anyway as far as offhand comment goes so uh This is the first why I want to address uh in in our talk today why CQRS what what is it precisely and when do you go about using it um so the principal motivation for CQRS is actually summarized in in this uh, in this one slide here so I'll describe what this slide actually is is um I, this is an application this is actually uh, a single uh SQL statement all right uh it's not generated by orm so uh, hibernate did not uh, gen- generate this for us this is a, literally a handwritten bit of sql uh that has 22 joins and six subqueries and good luck trying to figure out what this is this is a this the statement alone is a software module on its own right so this is what the core motivation of uh of uh cqrs actually is in uh, uh what it is is trying to is trying to help you not get into this situation right so uh there's some specific reasons why this occurs but the heart of this why this occurs is a paradigm mismatch of how we traditionally uh develop software systems uh in particular um what we try to do is that we have a single canonical model for our application and we use that both for the purposes of uh updating and maintaining data as well as querying data and that 
causes a impetus mismatch. Most, most, in most cases, what happens is that your model is actually optimized for the former case, namely updating and maintaining the data and not optimized for the query case, whereas the query case is actually the most common common case and the more complex case. And uh, exponentially, you have this, uh, this uh, uh, complexity creep because of that fundamental reason. And that's really what uh, CQRS is about and what it tries to solve. So CQRS stands for, uh, and, and it's a bit of a mouthful, right? So don't, don't expect to remember this right away if you haven't used it for a little while, but it's Command Query Responsibility Segregation, okay? A uh, very lame, uh, simple way of explaining that is that you, what you're trying to accomplish is avoiding that problem that you saw before by separating uh, your update model or what's the so-called write model from the read model, the model that you use to actually read data rather than write or, or update data. Uh, visually, this is how I would represent it. Okay, so uh, whether you have a web service or, or not, ultimately you have a UI, you have an inter interface of some kind, and you have a logical user of some kind. So uh, the way you write your application in the CQRS world uh, is that you literally look at things uh, differently depending on what you are exactly it is that you are trying to accomplish. Anything that results in a change in the system, so uh, an update uh, or uh, an insert, that's considered a command, right? So something that is, uh, you are asking the system to do something, to do something to change its state machine, right? Uh, and what that command, what, what those types of uh, interactions will be routed to is what's called the write model. So a, a model of, uh, a view of the application that is specialized for that purpose, for, specialized for the purpose of executing a state change, okay? Whereas uh, there's an, the queries on the other hand, the, the things that are not actually changing the state uh, of the system, but rather is querying the state of the system, that is routed to a separate model altogether, and, what, and that's called the read model. Uh, and generally, there's some mechanism whereby uh, you know these two things are synchronized. Namely, really, what's happening here is you're propagating the changes in the write model to the read model. Vice versa is obviously not not necessary, right? It's, uh, the, uh, the read model is not actually causing any change to the system other than uh, being a facilitator for for asking the question of uh, what is my system state right now, right? Uh, but there is some mechanism by which uh, changes to the right model will wind up uh, in, in the read model, okay? All right, so, I, uh, so let's talk about why you would do that. So this comes with some non-trivial complexity, and, and we'll see. Uh, it's, it's one thing to describe what this is, uh, and it seems simple on the surface, uh, but it's not actually not that easy to understand right away. It's, it's not the most obvious thing in the world. So it, there has to be a reason why you would uh, I incur this additional complexity cost and why you would want to do this uh, additional, additional uh, take on this additional maintenance and complexity and so on. Um, so these are your key characteristics of why you would want to do this. So the most compelling one for CQRS is, is that first query. So if, you, if a lot of your application queries look like that, Okay, it's a good indication that you have this problem, right? You have the problem where you're trying to do too much uh, from a, a single model of your application. And a simpler way of doing things is applying these CQRS techniques. So the goal of CQRS in this case is, uh, believe it or not, each of your queries really will look like as simple as select star from some view, okay, that is specific to that read or specific to that, that uh, data that you are after and then it's a, a where clause and it, it and an order by and so on and but no subqueries no complex joins and so on and so forth right so that's where you want to want to go once you have incurred this problem of 22 joins and uh, 12 uh, subqueries right it, it's this, that's what you want to get out of um, if you want to keep your system number one scalable and maintainable okay so that's a good indication uh, that's probably the number one reason to consider CQRS. The other benefit of applying CQRS is extremely high throughput systems. Okay, so this would be again, um, there is uh, these are, these would be high transaction uh, financial systems or things like logistics uh, and so on, where you have uh, a high de a, a high number of reads and writes, but the reads are are almost never symmetric to the writes. Right, so there's always a a differential. It's a never uh, sort of a fair ratio. It's often it's a very very skewed ratio. It's one to four or something of that nature on either side, depending depending on the application. So what CQRS allows you to do is because you actually do have two different models, 
uh, you're able to scale the read and write uh, completely separately, right? So, uh, for example, uh, you can put the read side and the write side on separate hardware altogether. Okay, so if the read side is, is a lot more, uh, has a lot more uh, volume to it, well, you can put more nodes of, of the read side and less nodes for the write side. You can uh, apply the right technology, okay, where, where, it's, uh, where it fits best. You can apply, uh, for example, typically a, an RDMS type solution for the right side, or even better, uh, an event source for the right side, and something that makes the best sense for the read side, whatever the read side model might be. It might be RDMS, it might be NoSQL, or what have you. Uh, uh, and finally, it, it, uh, the, the, the biggest, uh, actually, uh, uh, advantage for us that we see uh, is that uh, CQRS enables event sourcing. Uh, we'll talk about event sourcing in a second. But event sourcing actually doesn't work without CQRS. And to be honest with you, uh, this is what we see the most. Right? So uh, it's uh, rare that uh, a customer tells us we have a CQRS problem. Can you help us? Uh, you know, with, with Axon Framework, it's actually the opposite in most cases. Uh, what the customers usually come to us with is that they have a event sourcing problem and they need CQRS as an enabler. So it's sort of, uh, it has a nice correlation between it, but oftentimes it's the event sourcing that's the most uh, important portion. So we'll talk about a little bit about next about what event sourcing is. But before I do that, I just want to pause a little bit uh, and give you an opportunity to ask any questions. Obviously, uh, if, I, if it's a question, I'll, I'll, I'll answer myself in, a, in just a little bit. I'll ask you to hold. Uh, but uh, in general, um, you know, let's take this opportunity to uh, have any questions about CQRS, about all, everything that, that I've described so far. Yes, sir. So the read store, it's, uh, it's often what happens is that uh, it's just two different, dis two distinct concerns for most actually a lot of applications that we deal with. Uh, you know, the right side is uh, is one thing; it, it serves one purpose. For example, it serves the business, uh, it serves the purpose of uh, maintaining application integrity and maintaining data integrity and auditability on those those sorts of concerns, business logic type concerns. Whereas the right side often is really something a little bit different. Its uh, its purpose is uh, UI rendering or reporting or analytics or something else like that. So because of those reasons, there's always a, a differential between the number of reads and writes uh, in the types of applications that uh, we usually deal with. Uh, and uh, it, this is the most elegant way of solving that problem. Uh, so it, naturally, the, if, if your functional non-functional requirements are very different, it would lead you to different conclusions of what kind of storage mechanism, what kind of scalability, what kind of architecture you would use for either of those sites. Okay. I don't know if you're going to cover this later, but uh, in our use case, uh, the same, uh, within the same transaction, whenever we get an event comes in, we would query our data grid uh, for deletion and updates. So we know which system, which record should be deleted and updated, and in the end, we will do it right. In that kind of one transaction, you have both read and write. How, okay. how do you right. apply this pattern? Okay, so uh, there is actually a well-known answer to this to your question. It's a little bit beyond uh, our talk today. Let's take this offline, uh, but uh, there's definitely, a, this is actually one of the more uh, sort of philosophically contentious topics in CQRS. It can be done. There's, I think you need to get out of pure CQRS into more, a little bit more of a hybrid type thinking in that particular. That's probably the only rare exceptions where uh, CQRS does, pure CQ, CQRS actually doesn't work. Okay. Yes, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later. I'll touch upon it a little bit now. Uh, it really depends on, it's really difficult to generalize on this. Um, but what I will tell you is that it, it is easy to overuse CQRS. Uh, CQRS and event sourcing doesn't come for free. Um, so you should make sure that you have a legitimate case for it. Okay, but uh, there's no rhyme or reason as to where CQRS would apply. It really is very highly dependent on 
the use case uh, and the type of application and the type of usage patterns and so on. We have seen some patterns. We'll talk about that in a second. There are certainly some industries that tend to have those problems more frequently than others. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions? Good questions, by the way. Okay. Yes, sir. I just wanted to mention that there is a mic uh, at each desk, so if you want to ask questions, there is a small button. If you press that button, it will, the mic will turn on so that everybody can hear the question. Thanks. Sorry about that. I just wanted to make sure I am not uh, at least at least kind of uh, trying to uh, make an attempt of uh, keeping track of time. Okay, fair enough. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Does the read model ever read from like a totally separate database, or is it always like a materialized view? Like, how do you decide like when to do a totally separate database for the read model versus just materializing a view for your read sign? It's rare for us. So, uh, in fact, when, when you talk about uh, event sourcing, you'll see it's often uh, not the same database at all. Uh, that's the most common case for us. Uh, but it depends. Right? The, the, the answer is it depends. Uh, there's nothing wrong with using the same database. Often it, it comes down to the way you want to modularize your application, uh, the type of data, data store that's, that's most appropriate for the read or the write case, uh, and also scalability. Um, sometimes it's just that it's a lot easier to use two different data sources uh, rather than simply having a, a, a logical materialized view, if you will, in the same database. Just because you can, that, that's a, it's a handy way of separating the load at the database level also. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, where is this applicable for the real-time analytics? That's an interesting question. Uh, so we'll talk about this in a second when we talk about uh, event sourcing. So. One of the characteristics of our CQRS is you will almost always need to uh, embrace embrace a eventual consistency. Um, so it's not you are going getting a little bit away from acid per se. You can argue that that's not okay for real time systems. I would say uh, it's probably not realistic uh, to worry too much about that uh, because ultimately you do need to make some trade offs if you need to achieve scalability or. Uh, some of the other objectives that we talk about in general, you know, our customers do have pretty, uh, uh, you know, uh, high concurrency requirements, and you can argue they're real-time systems. Doesn't seem to cause any practical problems. Okay. So, uh, any other questions before I move on? No, excellent. So let's move on. So let's talk about why event sourcing. So this is the next why I, I want to get into uh, in our uh, in our uh, session today. So what is event sourcing? Uh, event sourcing, uh, the long and short of it, is a different way of storing data. Okay, so it's very different from uh, the normal way or, or the most uh, common way, RD, RDMS way of storing data. Typically when you uh, store data in an RDMS, what you're after is, is current state. Okay, what is the current state of my data? So you have a logical entity that probably uh, you know, makes sense if you're using domain-driven design. Uh, I hope it will make sense in, as a noun uh, in your business domain. And basically, what you're interested in in an RDMS is that you're interested in okay, what is the, what is the, uh, this data right now? Okay, uh, that is your your canonical model of storing data. Event sourcing is very very different from that. So, the way event sourcing work, works is that you're not just storing the current state of a given data, and in in, in fact. The way the data is stored, you won't even, uh, it won't even really directly tell you this is what this noun is that, that's in your system. It's a user or an account, uh, and uh, here's the current balance of this account, or, or here's uh, some other data about this account. What event sourcing instead does is that it's, it stores uh, the, your data as a, a literally an event stream. So it's, it's quite the inverse of how you would typically go about thinking about data storage. Um, so uh, let's say, think about it in terms of, let's say, uh, an account. So what you will actually be storing in an event store is actual events that happened to that account. So the account was 
initiated. There was a debit, there was a credit, there was interest paid, uh, there was a check cash and so on. And that's really literally what you will be storing. Those individual events that are meaningful to the business rather than uh, a domain entity itself. Right? Uh, and what you will eventually do is when you need that current state information, you will actually materialize that state in one way or the other. You will actually aggregate all of, the, all of those events that have occurred to that entity uh, and calculate what that, what that current state is. Now again, this is not the most natural way of thinking about this, right? So thinking about this problem, so why would you want to do this, right? Uh, and well, let's ex explain that in, in a second, but um, now let's sort of revisit uh, the connectivity between event sourcing and CQRS for a second. Right. So this is a, a graphical depiction of how these things correlate, and then they are very, very correlated. So uh, most of this is uh, familiar already. Again, we have a UI. We are separating commands from queries. Right. So the things that change the state of the application from uh, the stuff that is simply querying the state of the application. Uh, you have the read, the write model and the read model. And in this case, what you've determined is that the write model, the best way of storing the, the write model uh, is through an, through an event store. So it's not a the current state of uh, your write model that you are storing, you're actually storing that state as a, as a stream of events, okay? Uh, and what you are doing in, in that case, what, what is very curious in terms of uh, a nice side effect that happens is that now it's very easy to synchronize the, the read and the, and the write models, okay? Because each time you actually make a command, that command will result in a change in the state of the application and will emit an event to say, hey, I changed the state of the application and this is what I did, all right? Uh, and that exact same change can then be propagated as an event to the read model. So the read model can update itself, okay? So the read model in general basically becomes views, becomes materialized views of all this event stream and that's stored in the event store. Okay, so that's the connectivity between uh, CQRS and ES. Uh, as you can see, you know, when you have an event store, you need that uh, at some point in time, other than the uh, data in the event stream itself, you will need to know what the, what this, what the current state is. What is, the cur what is this data right now? Okay, what is the uh, current balance of this bank account? So you absolutely do need uh, the materialized views in one way or the other. It doesn't really work. Uh, the other way around. There are, uh, as far as I know, no cases where uh, somebody is just using a, uh, an event store. It's simply not a scalable mechanism, okay, so to do reads this way. Uh, but the, the important thing to note here is that now you can actually set this enables you to basically uh, create different views, not just one view of, this, of the single bit of data. So in this graphic, I actually intended the event store to be one thing, right? So let's say uh, it is that account case. So that account is a stream of events, but notice there's multiple views, right? So what, depending on what data you want to get about accounts, basically what you will have is a read model that's, that's composed of multiple views, views specific to use cases, right? Uh, and each use uh, and these views will be essentially propagated through events. Okay. So again, let's dig in into a little bit of why you would want to do this. Again, this is not, uh, you know, by comparison to a simple CRUD model where you just do a read and do a query of whatever the current state is. Obviously, this has a, a bit more complexity. When does this make sense then? The first, <clears throat> the most common case that we see today uh, is actually uh, applications that need a natural audit trail. There's some reason why you need you need to know not just the current state, but every single uh, change that resulted in, in that current state. So these would, again, uh, credit card transactions, right? Uh, bank transactions, these are all important things. These are general ledger problems, essentially. You need to record every single change that occurred because you need backward traceability. You need to understand how did I arrive at this, at this uh, state. Same thing for uh, very, very life or death type of applications. So for example, medical record management, hospital, hospital management. You need to know how how did how did what what occurred uh, for the current state of this medical bill, or what happened uh, in the health history of this patient that we arrived at at this point? And you need to store these uh, events indefinitely. It's not just about uh, taking a snapshot time of data, and, and that's all that is required. Often, regulatory uh, uh, reasons is another reason why you would want to keep these audit trails. So, a good example is uh, stock exchanges, right? So by and large, you don't actually care about a single trade 
right? You care about what is the current stock price and so on. But in for regulatory reasons, you need to keep an account of every single change that, that occurred to uh, a particular uh, particular stock. So you can go back and say, hey, this is what occurred. So I'm not uh, doing any kind of fraudulent trading or if there's uh, abnormal patterns that are detected later, you can, a regulator can ask you questions on it and you, you can go back and say, hey, this is the exact thing that happened. And I can tell you, uh, you know, minute, second by second, the exact changes that occurred to arrive at this state. Okay, so this is one of the actually principal reasons for event sourcing. Uh, temporal reports is, a, is another reason. So think about this for, for a second now. So let's assume for a second that you're not doing event sourcing and, and all you are really interested in is uh, current uh, current data, right? So a problem that that causes is that you've, you're losing history, right? Uh, you, you know what the data is currently, but you don't really, as soon as the change occurs, you no longer know what this data was six months ago. Okay, or three months ago. So in order to, if you were to answer those questions, the only way to do that would be determining beforehand what the frequency of reporting would be and essentially run those views and store them off somewhere, right? And that requires a lot of forethought. You need to know how frequently do I need to run these reports. You need to know exactly what the reports are and what type of data are you looking for. In fact, traditional data warehousing systems, this is what they do. Right? You, you kind of guess at what kind of data you would need. You populate a some kind of data warehouse and you figure out, okay, what frequency is good enough for me uh, so that I can run reports uh, down the line. If you are doing this though, you essentially have a record of every single change that ever happened to that data that you're interested in, which means you can go back and do temporal reporting any point in time, right? And you can also, also generate projections, right? So you can say, Okay, uh, this was, <clears throat> this was a, uh, I, I can tell you, this was the state of this uh, stock, uh, let's say, a week ago. And if uh, had these things happened, I can tell you that the current state of data would be this, as opposed to what it is today. Or if I tried an, another alternative set of events uh, on it, this is what would happen. Right? So this, this is another important use case for uh, event sourcing as well. Um, this is a minor reason, but it's a side effect, and it's an important one. And this has to do with performance. And we actually do have some uh, customers that actually use CQRS and event sourcing purely for the purposes of performance. So if you look at the performance characteristics of all of this, when you are storing things as an event stream, all you are recording is actually an insert. Right, which is the fastest possible change you can make to a system. It's faster than a delete, it's fast, faster than an update. Right? Uh, and when you are using uh, event sourcing, all you really do is an insert. Right? So a state change is an insert. If you want to invalidate a bit of data, it's actually an insert to say, please invalidate this bit of data. So it's the fastest write possible, and it is the fastest read possible because your, your read models can be very, very highly specialized, highly optimized to the specific case that, that uh, you are looking for. Uh, we do have some e-commerce uh, customers in particular, they use event sourcing specifically for that reason. It's because they want to achieve scalability. They want to achieve very high throughput, very, very fast writes, and very, very fast reads as well. Okay, so let's now talk about, uh, actually before I do that, um, let's stop a second and ask any questions about event sourcing. So uh, any questions on event sourcing and uh, how uh, the CQRS and, uh, and event sourcing sort of play together? Can you give an example of like practical example where you apply CQRS and event sourcing? Um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll actually have an example application that I'll talk about in a second. Okay. Uh, but again, some of the practical use cases that we've seen is banking. Uh, this is a general ledger problem. Credit cards, uh, that's a general ledger problem. Stock exchange records, medical records, uh, medical billing records. Uh, transportation, uh, because you need to know you need you have all of those problems, right? You need to know exactly what what how, how did I uh, what is the current state of, for example, my cargo, right? And how did I arrive at this? How did I arrive at this point? How could things have been different if I had routed things differently, uh, for for example, right? So all of those problems exist in in the in the logistics domain as well. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Sir. How do you handle changes to events, like the schema that makes up an event, um, and 
Um, so we you, in Axon, there's various ways of solving this problem. Um, the one that Axon espouses is something called opcasting. So uh, if you just if your if your data changes are additive, you don't need to do anything at all; they just work. But if you introduce a backward in, in, incompatible change, you basically need to uh, have when you're doing the reads, you need to have some kind of opcaster that will translate from your previous format to your new format. So all of the old data would be so quote unquote upcast it to the new format. And it's a programmatic thing that you have to, will have to add at the framework level to handle that. But it, it does happen, right? And people do introduce non-backward compatible changes. But in general, it's not an issue if, you, if it's an additive change because uh, and in the end, what happens is uh, this event stream is serialized into something, right? Uh, in it could be XML or it could be JSON. And those are relatively good formats uh, by themselves, even Java serialization. Uh, which you do have support for. All of these things are relatively good about handling non-breaking changes, okay, to, to, your, to your model. Uh, they're not so good about bre introducing breaking changes. Mm -hmm. How often are the read models updated? Like, I imagine it's not on every write. It's, it's, it's on every write. It's on every write. Literally, yeah. So that's how you're achieving a near uh, synchronization, right? So that's where, where the eventual cons consistency part is coming in. So that's a good, good question. I probably didn't cover it too, too well. So in, in all these, you could put the read and the <coughs> write model synchronization in an asset transaction, right? Uh, and in fact, that's the default. That's what that's but by default what we do. We, we uh, update, we emit an event uh, when we register uh, an actual change to the, to the data store. Uh, and we propagate that in the same transaction to, to the to the right model, but that's not a scalable thing. Uh, in most or uh, most of our clients are not doing that. Uh, they are actually breaking this out into uh, an event bus, okay, and they're asynchronously re asynchronously receiving the notification of these changes, notification of each of these events that are getting getting emitted, uh, and they're in real time updating their materialized views right then and there. So uh, it is almost always. Uh, um, <coughs> Almost always near real time. So, uh, so the sequence can be controlled. The Pardon? The sequence can be controlled. The sequence, sequence of what? The event which uh, go for the read uh, is controllable or just? Uh, uh, it's yes, it's guaranteed by the event store. Okay. Is the the events are transmitted uh, in the order that the changes occur? That's actually a key characteristic of most uh, event stores. Uh, and actually, it's one of the reasons why we can uh, support certain types of data stores as an event store, because of that reason is because they can't guarantee that sequencing uh, of the em emitting writing uh, uh, sequencing of writes and sequencing of em emitting the the events, the ordering of the events. Oh. Mm -hmm. Earlier, when you were talking about uh, temporal reporting, and how uh, that had traditionally been solved through data warehousing. Uh, I believe that SQL now offers temporal tables where every mutation is stored as binary. Mm -hmm. um, you still have the complexity of like the read and write locks, but I think that. Mm -hmm. that yeah, effectively, what they're doing is they're they're doing exactly what an event store does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when a new command comes in, so how do you uh, restore the current state? So like, do you have to replay all the events which happened since? Or That's a very good question. Um, so let's answer it. Uh, by default, yes. So what happens is uh, in an event source application, uh, the first time you need to load the aggregate state, and you will need to arrive some arrive at some kind of aggregate state. Typically, you, it's useful for business logic. You need to know, okay, this is my current balance, and hence I can uh, take another credit. Uh, I can issue. Uh, I can service another uh, credit. Uh, command or service on the debit command if, uh, if, the, if the bank balance is greater than zero. So what happens is uh, the first time that that aggregate is accessed, you actually re are replaying, effectively replaying the current state of the aggregate <coughs> and rendering it in memory. Right? Um, now, the question you should ask is, well, isn't that what happens if you have uh, several million uh, events in your event store, how, is that, how does that scale? So it scales because of using a technique called snapshotting. Um, so what that does is that you can attach an algorithm or simply tell the event store, to tell the event store, please create an automatic snapshot uh, every some condition, 
right? So every few months or every so many records, create a snapshot of, of my data. So it's not that the previous data would be deleted. The previous data will continue to be stored. It's just that uh, in the event store, we'll store just a snapshot uh, of that data. And that's how it scales. Almost every single uh, customer in production uses snapshotting as a technique because, because of this reason, because they need uh, the initial load of, of the aggregate to be relatively quick. Okay, uh, But that's, it, it's a general, it's a uh, well understood sort of trade off uh, for CQRS and event sourcing, but that's how you solve it, uh, is, you, is you also store a snapshot. Uh, but you don't only store the snapshot, uh, the principal storage there is actually the event stream. So, uh, competition of uh, aggregation. Is happening on the rate side or uh, com competition of the aggregate in terms of what is necessary for to constitute a meaningful write model is happening. The framework is actually doing that for you in case of Exxon. Uh, that's happening on the read on the right side, but the read side is also doing an aggregate aggregation of its own kind. Right? Uh, what it is doing is it is taking every single event and only storing the current state da data that it needs. So an example would be again bank balance, right? So we don't, <coughs> we, we wouldn't want to store the cu the current balance as a, as an event. It doesn't make sense. What we will do is uh, record every single event that occurred to, occurred to that uh, account. But we do need on the right side to keep track of what the current balance is, because typically we will need that um, in order to successfully execute a change, right? Because you need you need that business logic state in there. Uh, but the read model is also keeping track of things like what is the current balance, okay, and updating that per per event that's emitted. Uh, what is, you know, uh, for this for this particular user, what is their expended monthly expenditure for a given category? How much do they spend on uh, utilities? How much do they spend on mortgage, etc.? All of those things are all also being calculated on the fly, right, as these events are being, uh, events are being emitted by the event store. So the frequency frequent requests which come for that uh, different type of aggregations, right? So we'll get cached up somewhere in the read? On the read model is always cached. It's effectively a, 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 a cache, a persistent cache, uh, really, if, if you look at it that way. This is a, you can throw away the read model, it's just, a, and, in, and replay it and reconstitute it uh, by rereading and replaying all the events if you wanted to. So it, it is a, a cache in a very real sense. Can Kafka be an example of event store? Kafka can be a, uh, an example of an event store. There's a nice uh, blog entry out there, actually, why it's not. Uh, it's just that it's, uh, it's uh, you know, taking a hammer and, you know, uh, trying to uh, square peg round hole problem, right? It's uh, just because it's a golden hammer doesn't mean it's a solution to every problem. Uh, Kafka is, its principal use case is for uh, asynchronous distributed communication. Right. It's it's a it's a really a, a communication bus more than it is anything else. It happens to be able to persist those uh, events that that it uh, transports, but other than that, it's really difficult to apply it to the to the uh, events store store case. Uh, I'll give you a concrete example. Um, so if you have fifty different uh, entities that you want to store as an event source source model, you need fifty different Kafka streams to do that. Uh, it's just a, not a very practical thing to be doing, and you have to create a Kafka stream for each time you need you add an aggregate and so on and so forth. Whereas an events storage mechanism, right, all of that stuff happens under the hood, and actually all of the events for, per a given aggregate would be stored in a in a single uh, single entity uh, rather than uh, some, something else. So uh, Kafka can be used for this. It's not a very good use case. Okay. Any other questions? All right, moving forward. So why is it uh, that you need Axon uh, for any of this? Uh, couldn't you just uh, do it by hand? Well, you can, right? Uh, there's nothing stopping you from doing it. In fact, uh, certainly in the .NET world where you don't have something like Axon, that's what people do, right? They, they write their own uh, CQRS and event sourcing system by themselves. Uh, here's the problem with it. Uh, the fact that there is a framework that does that, uh, and you know we're a, uh, we're a company that with customers uh, should tell you that this is a kind of a stupid thing and a waste of your time. 
right, uh, to do this. Uh, you'll be writing a whole bunch of infrastructure level code to handle things like ordering and transactions and serialization, deserialization, uh, event distribution across, across, across nodes and so on and so forth. So you'll wind up with a whole bunch of boilerplate right, that you need to maintain forevermore. Um, this is the reason why you would want not want to do this and, and why you would want to have a framework like Axon do all of the low level stuff for you. Uh, and I'll show you when, when we get to the code examples, you know, your code, your code really is just your business logic. Uh, there really is no, uh, very little indication of that this is even using CQRS other than the fact that it's applying those patterns. Okay, so this is why you would want to use, uh, you, would, you would want to use something like Axon for this. The other thing that uh, Axon does is that it has actually, actually has e uh, API guidance, right? It's not just a unopinionated API. It's an API designed for a specific purpose in, in, in terms of implementing CQRS and yes, in a DDD context, right? So uh, it, it will give you if, you, if you adopt Axon, you don't really have to think much about, uh, okay, how do I go about implementing CQRS and event sourcing? Because you there is only one way of implementing it, uh, pretty much. And it, it uh, will give you, uh, will, will essentially take away a lot of design, unnecessary design discussions because uh, it, it'll tell you this is how you should implement this and this is how this pattern actually looks like. Uh, the other interesting thing that Axon does is, uh, we talked about this in a little bit before, right? So when do you decide that, uh, you know, it's, is it a materialized view in the same database? Is it two different databases? Uh, you know, is it is it one monolithic application? Is it multiple different applications with the read and write side separated? All of those questions is not something you actually need to think about ahead of time with Axon because uh, the, what happens with Axon is all of those infrastructure level concerns. Okay, where is the read site stored? Where is the write site stored? Uh, w you know, where which node does this stuff belong to, and so on and so forth. All of that stuff is actually configuration. You can configure the the uh, configure the the bus and the internal plumbing of Axon to change those particular details without affecting your basic programming model, right? Because these these things are in the end, infrastructure concerns, right? They're not business logic concerns. So your business logic should not change when you change these decisions. So that is actually one, one of the very important reasons why people are, uh, why our customers are adopting us, okay? Is because we they don't need to make these decisions and they can change these decisions too. Once they make a decision, they can go back and change it with, uh, just by changing um, some Axon configuration rather than needing to change uh, large parts of their application. <coughs> Okay, so let's put it all together. I think uh, a lot of this actually begins to make more sense when you take a look at, uh, at, a, at an example application. Uh, so I just have an example applications for this as well. I, I think it's the bare minimum, simplest thing that you can have, okay, in order to understand CQRS. And yes, it's up there on GitHub. Uh, let me see how we're doing on time. Okay, so I have about 10 minutes of time left, so I don't have a tremendous amount of time left. Obviously, I'll be happy to uh, stay longer. If, if you guys want me to uh, stay longer, I'll do that, but I, I also won't, don't want to hold you up. Okay, you don't have to stay here if you don't want to. Uh, the reason for this is that if you go to the GitHub, uh, GitHub page here, it actually has step-by-step uh, -step instructions on how you can run this application yourself. Okay, so uh, I have a few screenshots, uh, you know, just a few instructions, and obviously the code itself. Right, and uh, so everything that I'll do in a demo here, you can repeat yourself at, at your own desk, um, at your own time, and take a look at all of this uh, yourself. Okay, so let me um, just do a quick demo uh, without too much further ado of my application. Here it is. Uh, so this is a, a Maven-based application. It's just a Maven Java application. In this case, I've chosen to use Spring Boot. You can use. You don't have to use Spring Boot necessarily. You can use just Spring Framework, you can use Java EE, you can not use anything and just use Java SE, all of that is possible. This happens to be a Spring Boot uh, project. I'll go ahead and run it. Uh, why <laughs> Maven is always unpredictable as to when it decides to download something and when it doesn't. Anyway, okay. <coughs> OK, 
Okay, so our application is up and running. Uh, I'll show you the application real quick. Uh, it is running on port eight, uh, local host port 8080. I'll just open that up for you. Okay, so this is a use case of a gift card. So that's what the, that's what the domain is. So uh, essentially you issue a gift card with a certain amount, right? And then you redeem it. So there's actually re really one, two type of events, issuing a, a card and then redeeming it. Uh, and each of the redemption is, is, uh, is essentially an event, right? So you redeem it until it runs out of money. Uh, so I'll do a quick demo here. I will say I'm gonna issue two cards of 50 each. So I'll submit uh, uh, these events. And, and basically what's happening is that I now have two different cards. As you can see, I've issued a, a, a GUID based ID here. Uh, initial value is 50. I've issued it right now. And the remaining value is 50 right at this point. So I'll take one of these uh, IDs. Whoops. And I'll say, okay, so I'll uh, uh, redeem $25 on it. Okay, so the, as you can see, the remaining value is now 25. I'll redeem another, uh, let's say, $10. Okay, and here we have 15. So obviously this is a toy application, but, but the objective here is to uh, show you why, uh, how CQRS actually looks like implementation wise rather than, and conceptually a little bit too. So let's, let's take a step back for a second and think about this application in a, in a realistic sense, okay? So in a realistic application, you would have a, a, an, an administrative interface that will allow you to issue cards, okay? And uh, in the card issue, uh, issue, uh, you know, you'll have some kind of uh, some kind of interface that tells you, hey, these are all of the cards that you have issued. Some information about the uh, about the card and what the current remaining balance is. You will have probably another interface that is a that is some kind of service interface with vendors, right? So that will tell you, hey, they, I have a redemption, and then you'll uh, you'll do some authorization authorization and authentication, and then say, hey, whether this card can be redeemed or not, right? And you'll internally keep track of what those redemptions are, and you have to keep a record of every single transaction that occurred. So poss possibly a customer will have another interface that, uh, that they log in and say, hey, these are all of the things that have happened to this gift card, okay? Uh, and finally, you need to have uh, some kind of reporting mechanism in, in the end. So the reason this uh, makes sense from a CQRS and ES standpoint is it goes back to the, um, you know, principally why we want to do a lot of these things. So number one is that the read and write writes are very separate. Right? So, uh, these are uh, essentially, uh, the reads probably happen very infrequently in this case. Uh, the writes are a lot, lot more frequent, so you'd have a lot more transactions. So it, it's actually the inverse case of what we normally think. It's a very high write and a low read situation. Uh, and also uh, you need, you have that auditability requirement. You know, you need to understand uh, you need to keep track of every single transaction that occurs. So it's a general ledger problem. Uh, and it's a reporting problem too, and an analytics problem. Because this is, all, this is all financial stuff. In the end, even a customer would probably want to know, okay, how did I use this gift card, right? Uh, and you might have the, the company that's issuing these, uh, these cards, they would want to know what are people doing with these gift cards? What are the patterns of purchases and so on? Right? So these are all good cases for you know, what we talked about in terms of uh, CQRS and event sourcing. Okay, so let's take a little bit in, into this application. Uh, uh, let me, oh, actually, let me show you one more thing here. So uh, I will actually issue the, uh, uh, let's take a look at the, what's happening in the database itself. So I do have H2 open for this application. Okay, so here's the H2 console. Uh, I'm logging in, literally I'm logging in, in it, into the database. Uh, I'll issue a query for you that actually is, is on GitHub as well. So I'll issue the query. Uh, and let me increase the font here. Okay, hopefully that's visible enough. So this is actually the event store itself. This is how the, the how what is actually stored in the event store. So you can see that there's a global index. There's an event identifier for each type of uh, event that is issued. Uh, the metadata is really what is the, the actual data that happened here. 
So this is a trace ID and correlation ID. You'll see that in a second. These are IDs that are used internally by the framework to resolve uh, the commands on events correctly. Uh, this is the actual payload. I'll, I'll increase the size here of this. Uh, actually, I don't need to. Uh, the uh, payload is, in this case is very, very simple. So I have an issue event. As you can see, the payload type is issued event. Uh, it's issue with an ID and an amount of 50 and another one, another issued event with uh, an amount of 50 and uh, another ID here uh, and two different two different redemption events. Okay, so each of these, this is literally the, the, the data source, the underlying data source uh, of for, for the event store okay, that you're looking at. So every single change is actually recorded. There is no recording of, okay, what is the, what is the current balance of this thing? Right? That's not stored here. This is simply the, the, the event store that you're, uh, the event store data. Okay, so let's take a look at, uh, let me see how much time I have. Okay, so I don't have that much time. I have five minutes of time. So actually, let me not, uh, uh, take, uh, let, let me not dive into the code right now. Uh, let me take the next five minutes to answer any questions that you may have of what you saw so far. Yes, sir. It's like there was a sequence ID in the database. Can you talk about that? that is yeah. So sequence ID is that that's the magic thing that's allowing the ordering to occur. Uh, literally, that sequencing ID is used to ensure that the events are emitted in the order that, that the changes occurred. So, uh, and that's actually used on the read side as well. So uh, taking this a step further, let's say you have, you're in a distributed environment, right? And uh, the write side happens on, on one side uh, and the read side is, is something separate from that. This ID is actually what's used to make sure, to keep track of what is received on the read side. Right? So uh, the read side actually records Here's how far I've read, okay? And then uh, let's assume that you have more than one reads and they actually share segments. So uh, each of these, each of the nodes will say, hey, I'm gonna read the next 10. Uh, and all of that is done actually through the, through the sequence ID uh, that you noticed. So it's a, actually a very important bit of information. Exactly. Sequence. Yep, and that's exactly right. And in fact, uh, the the framework is guaranteeing that that's thread safe. So all of those uh, that all those commands that are being issued are actually thread safe, are happening in a, in a thread safe fashion, allowing us to guarantee that sequence. They're all transactional. Mm -hmm. okay. The right side is yes. The right side is mm -hmm. That looks like a global ID. It is a global ID. Yes. So your question is, if, if I'm writing two to the same aggregate. Um, the global ID is going to be different, presumably, for those two rights. Uh, yes. Should there be That's a correct. version, uh, a position for a particular aggregate? No, so the uh, so each of these aggregates are, are is, is just a stream of events, right? So the aggregate identifier is the one that you saw in the in the very left about the metadata. Right, so that's what's telling us, hey, uh, the, the, and the global sequencing is actually, do we use global sequencing? Actually, we do. We, use, we do use global sequencing, I believe. So you don't it's not aggregate, aggregate specific. Aggregate version or aggregate? Uh, I think, I, I'm not sure about that. I think we do. Uh, uh, but what I do know is that yeah, the, the sequencing is guaranteed for each aggregate. I don't think it's, it's global. There might be a reason why we want uh, global sequencing. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, it may have to do with cross aggregate one dependencies. Thing, I could see one for being for the order, the order of your stream, mm -hmm. then if to resolve conflicts for a particular aggregate, I would assume you would need something to say, hey, I have two two writes coming in at the same aggregate at the same time. They have to resolve that or throw an exception or something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and in the R case, we just uh, make sure that the order is, is guaranteed because it's a uh, we essentially guarantee sequential access to those aggregates. Yeah. So that means logically it's going to be globally a single thread, although you, you could have multiple threads to hand off the... Per, per aggregate only. Per aggregate. Per aggregate only, not across aggregates. So per aggregate it, it, is, a, it is single threaded. Uh, uh, and in fact it's single threaded uh, even at the data source level. So if you, even if you have two nodes of the right level, we're still attempting to uh, guarantee some synchron synchronicity at the at the data source level. So uh, it, it is in that sense it's synchronized, but it's not synchronized across aggregates as far as I know. In fact, I, in fact, I yeah, I'm pretty sure it's not. 
It's a only synchronized per that aggregate. So, so performance-wise, you're counting on each write to very fast because mm -hmm. it's a single thread, right? Right. Mm -hmm. so you're blocking the next write. Right, blocking the next one. Yeah, so you shouldn't have extended transactions in in the in in when you're doing the command. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, if you're having extended transactions, that's another use case called sagas, uh, because that you're right. That will break down the eventual consistency portion of it. If the write is so so slow that uh, everything is being held up by that, um, so yeah, we are expecting it's relatively not a lot of operations in that command handling. Yeah. Can you speak to the project? Pardon. Do we use a read? Yes. In this case, it's the same data the database. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll show you. I'll show it to you in, in the H2. So, uh, for example, card summary. Okay, uh, this is actually a, uh, actually a materialized view. So this is a, this is a, this is this materialized view actually. The one that you see down here. This is card summary. So, it's a, this is actually being read from that table. That's that's the table that's literally being populated uh, as as each event occurs. In effectively, it is implemented as a materialized view in the same database. In this case, right? But it doesn't need to be that way. It can be two two, two separate databases altogether. Uh, any other questions? Okay, excellent. So, uh, all right. So let's take a little bit of uh, take a look a little bit of a look out, uh, at the code itself. So, where it makes sense is actually to take a look at the uh, command side first, right? Because that's that's where the most of the uh, interesting business logic type, type stuff usually happens. So the, the, I've, uh, if you, hopefully you can see some of it, but I've, I've tried to segment this out. You know what, uh, this is not a good uh, place to do that because NetBeans doesn't uh, allow very good uh, magnification. Let's take a look at all this in, in uh, GitHub itself. Let's do that. So back in here. Sorry. Okay. So source main gift card and let's start with the command side. And did I increase the enough? I think this is probably better. Okay. All right. So let's start with the with the commands themselves. Okay. And the commands are actually relatively simple. I won't show you all of them. I'll show you just one command. Uh, so, we, like I said, the, uh, in in this case, the commands are very simple. There's an issue command and a redeem command. Two different two different commands. Uh, the issue command is uh, looks like something like this. Okay, so this is just a pojo. Uh, it has two different uh, fields to it: ID and amount. So, uh, what uh, the card that I'm about to issue? What what ID do I do I want to assign it? And what is the amount that I'm issuing it for? Notice that other than these, this is basically just normal getters and setters, really nothing much to it. Uh, the only magic thing here is a target, uh, a target aggregate identifier. Okay, and so what is this? What this annotation is doing, it's an it's a axon specific annotation. What it is saying is, uh, this is an issue, this is a, this is a command. I want this command to land into uh, an aggregate. Okay, I don't know yet which, which aggregate. We'll figure that out. But whichever aggregate that it lands on, I want you to use this ID field to correlate it. Okay, so uh, if I issue an ID of such and such, it would land in uh, uh, ABC123 is my ID. So aggregate ABC123 should resolve resolve this uh, this command. Okay, it's actually not important as important for issue issues. It's more important for redeem. Right. So in this case, you're saying, okay, I want to redeem a card. This is the ID of the card I want to redeem. This is how much I want to uh, redeem it by. And this is where, again, you would use that ID field to say, please redeem against this, this aggregate instance. Okay, so that's where that uh, tar target aggregate identifier annotation is coming in, and it's required for a command. Uh, and so that's, that's about it in terms of the command itself now. I told you it's it's uh, in CQRs. It's basically a 
there's going to be two distinct entities, right? So one is the command, right? And that's part of your design pattern, the change that you want to apply, and the event that results, okay? Uh, as a result of, of that change in change in state. So for each command, generally you will have a uh, you will have an event. Okay. In this case, they happen to be named the same thing. They don't have to be, but in 99.9% .9 cases, they are actually named um, essentially the same thing. So when I issue a command, the command succeeds, I issue a, an issued event to say, hey, um, as a result of executing this change, I'm issuing this event. Same thing for, for uh, redemption here. So I'll show you the redeem event. Uh, it's a very, it's really nothing much to it at all. It's just, uh, a, a, again, a POJO. It actually doesn't actually need any annotations whatsoever. It's a representation of what changed. Okay, what do I want to tell my read model that has actually changed? Uh, and what do I actually want to store in, in the event store? Okay, so in this case, uh, when there's a redemption, I want to store the ID and I store want to store the amount. And I want to tell my, my read models, this is the ID and this is the amount. Please figure out what it is that, that you need to um, you need to materialize. I do have a few uh, annotations here. They're really just necessary because I'm, I'm as, as you saw in the in the data store. I'm storing this as JSON. So um, unfortunately, I'm, uh, the JSON framework needs a little bit of annotations to make things work. So I just have that for that reason and really that reason alone. Gift card is the actual aggregate. Okay, so this is uh, in a realistic application. This is where uh, your all of your business logic will reside. Right? So this is the guy that's taking in commands. This is this is a represent key representation of your right side, uh, and figures out how do I make this when under what circumstances uh, should I allow this change to occur, and when when this changes when when this changes occurs, what event do I emit that needs to be stored? Right. So it's sort of a coordinator of, for the right side, if you will. Uh, so, in uh, again, remember I told you about the API as design guidance. So, uh, the way you represent a event stored uh, event storage aggregate is through the aggregate annotation. You simply say at aggregate. This is again an axon annotation that will say, "Hey, this is this is an aggregate that uh, that uh, is part of my right side." So, uh, in this aggregate, uh, there's not a lot of state that I'm I'm needing to maintain. I'm maintaining the ID because I need I need that to for the correlation and, and to do everything else meaningful. So uh, the way you, and you, there's a couple of different annotations you can use. In this case, I'm use, actually using the JPA annotations because I've used JPA as an event store, uh, actually under the hood. So it's simply the add ID annotation, saying this is the ID of my aggregate, and each aggregate will require an ID. Uh, and the only thing I really need is a remaining value. Right, I need to. I don't need to know the initial things like the initial value or who does this card belong to, and so on and so forth. In this case, in order to execute my business logic, I just need to know what is the remaining value of this card. Uh, so these are the command handlers, so to say. Okay, so these are the things that that's actually making that that is uh, making sure that this uh, command can actually succeed. Right. So uh, this is where your business logic will reside. So in this case, I have just have some simple business logic. For example, when I receive the issue command, and notice that the issue command is being is being uh, the command handler is actually the constructor for this aggregate. Okay, so you you construct an aggregate whenever there's an issue command. So uh, all I'm making sure is, hey, uh, I have a non-negative uh, amount that I'm I'm starting this card out with, uh, and if that is true, then I simply say apply this apply this event. So I'm allowing this change to occur. Uh, and the event that should occur as a result of me executing this command is issue command, uh, and the ID should be you know whatever it is that the command's ID is, and the amount should be whatever the issue amount is. Okay, and that's it. The moment you do that, actually, what the event store is doing is that it is storing this event as you saw in in in, in the event storage, and then emitting it. Okay, so uh, it will say, uh, and and that event from from then on will be received by all of the read model. Uh, read, read sides as well. Similar thing for the rede redeem command. It's a little bit more involved here. I need to do just a little bit more business logic to make sure that uh, you know I can actually redeem this, uh, re redeem the, uh, execute the redeem command properly. Uh, but basically the same principle. Make sure that this change can actually occur, and then if it can, uh, emit the the actual event that should be stored and transmitted. Okay. Uh, now the first 
uh, guy that will actually just if you a moment if you don't mind this is, uh, it's difficult to follow if I don't follow this through right away. Um, the first uh, um, uh, element in the system that will actually receive the stored event is this entity itself because it also needs to change its internal state, right? Because we're needing to maintain, uh, for example, the ID and the remaining value. So the first person that will actually, uh, first part of the system that will actually receive this event is actually the entity itself. So at this point, we, we've stored it, we've successfully stored this, uh, stored this event in the event store. We're telling the aggregate, yes, your, your change actually has been stored. Go ahead and change your internal state. Okay, and this is your your calculated internal state, by the way. Right, so this is a uh, this is not something that is stored in in the data store. This is in, in memory only. Right, so for example, uh, in the redemption event, I'm simply updating the remaining value. I don't need to store that in the in the event store because I can arrive at this value by simply by replaying all of my events. Yes, sir, you had a question on this. Um, so on the apply, when you showed the uh, the database, the payload type was the fully qualified package name. Is right. That yes. It's the full. Yep. Yep. So fully, uh, that's how you uniquely identify a, 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 a type of event. So what happens if I want to change, move, move somebody out of the package? You'd have to uh, essentially write an opcaster. Okay. Yeah. The, that will translate that record into whatever the whatever that uh, future version of the record is. So that is essentially, uh, believe it or not, that's all there, that there is to the right side of this. So let's take a look at the uh, at the read side. So the read side is quite complicated. I'll start with a, I'll just show you a simple part. Uh, the, I'll show you the part that does the uh, card summary calculation. Okay, so I'll show you the card summary. Uh, the card summary in this case I've chosen to implement it as a JPA. Right, so it's simply a JPA entity and it corresponds to that other table that I showed you. Right, so this is uh, simply, Card summary. It has. I have some selects here that I that I do against this. Uh, against this uh, over here, I want to, a little bit more data. Okay, so I want to store uh, the ID, the initial value, when was it issued at, what is the remaining value, and so on. Uh, other than that, there's not a whole lot going on here. It's a uh, and this is intentional. This is how really it should look like. Okay, so uh, these are going to be very specialized uh, uh, views for a very specialized cases. In this case, rendering the card summary. Uh, and when you're doing a query on that, as you can see, the queries are are incredibly simple, right? And it's because of the, or because of the fact that you're not needing to do joins, you're not needing to do any visualizations. So imagine for a second, if you if I wasn't using event store, uh, using wasn't using this, and I needed to render this directly from uh, from the ledger, the general ledger, and I wasn't using event store, saying how that will how this thing would look like, right? If you were to try try to calculate uh, the current remaining value. Uh, the current state based on uh, the general ledger values, right? This would be quite, quite a bit more complicated. But in this case, it's not because all we're doing is we're we're actually rendering this uh, entity on the fly by maintaining a uh, maintaining a materialized view. So this guy is actually updated by card summary projection. Okay. So how does card summary projection actually look like? It's it's a again it's just really a pojo. It doesn't need to be anything. Uh, I'm doing a little bit of uh, dependency injection here. I want to inject the entity manager uh, and the event bus. Okay, in, in this case, so I need to do a little bit more uh, than I normally would. Otherwise, this can actually just be a pojo. In this case, hap it happens to be a Spring component by the add co as you can see from the add component annotation. This is the event handler. Okay, so just like the uh, entity itself was uh, maintaining its state. Over here, where where what we're after is that we want to make sure uh, that we're uh, that we're updating the view, okay, as events occur. So same thing, very similar to what I in this case very simplistic, right? Very similar to what I would be doing in, on the aggregate side. Uh, just take the redeem event, you know, to find the card summary object, corresponding card summary object, let's say uh, by the ID, okay, and that's that ID is in this case part of my event, right? The, all this stuff was being done on the right side transparently, right, as, as you saw. Uh, and all I'm really doing is setting the remaining value, okay, and uh, making sure that uh, this record is updated uh, in the database um, as, as I move along. Obviously, realistically, this the read side and the right side is usually vastly different. Uh, the right side will be a lot more complicated than, uh, than what you see here. Uh, we do have uh, another abstraction called query handler, 
Okay, similarly, uh, similar to what you have event handler and a command handler, you also have a something uh, similar abstraction called query handler. You don't have to use it. Okay, uh, it's uh, optional. Real, uh, you could uh, this thing could just be a GPA. It could have directly uh, just uh, taken some uh, primitives as as an argument and produced some other uh, domain objects. Okay, that makes sense for you. Uh, in this case, we're using Axon to handle the queries as well. Um, probably in this session, it'll be too much to talk about why that is. Uh, but basically, we take a, a find card summary query, produce a result. And all we're really doing here is uh, doing is issuing that query, right? issuing, issuing the current state of the materialized view. There is a little bit more to this application. I don't want to um, go into it too, too much unless uh, you re uh, any of you really, really, really want to uh, do that. Uh, let me just finish off by uh, tackling one other important topic. This is actually a topic on its own right. It's a separate, uh, separate uh, talk altogether. So all of these things are important. Um, but what, what we've noticed is uh, people are talking about it a little bit more these days. Uh, and the reason they're talking about it is, is because of microservices. There is some tie-in between CQRS, uh, uh, ES, uh, and event sourcing. And in particular, there's another related uh, con concept called CQS that I won't have a lot of time to talk, talk about. So why, does the, why is this the case? Um, the principal reason this is the case, uh, as you've seen in the code, uh, when you are applying the uh, CQ, uh, CQRS, everything is very, very loosely coupled, right? And this goes on to why I was using that query abstraction. So instead of directly uh, invoking, getting the entity by ID and issuing a uh, CRUD operation on it, you're using events as a abstraction mechanism. Similarly, you know, there's no direct tie-in between the read and the write side. The connectivity is really the events. So you're emitting the events from the right side, and it's being read by the by the read side. Right? But there's no uh, tight coupling of these two objects together. Right? So there's some other abstraction, namely the axon buses that are that are making all these resolutions happen. So as a result, you can essentially use all of these CQRS separation points as a, as as loose coupling infrastructure. So if you wanted to uh, separate the read and the right side, you could very easily do that now. If you wanted to separate the query reads readers from the writers, you could very easily do that. Uh, and that renders it much easier in terms of microservices because now you have an easy way of decoupling. You don't have to uh, take a highly coupled application and then try to decouple it. It's already, it's already loosely coupled, and hence putting it on a separate node is not, not a very big deal at all. In fact, as I mentioned, in, 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 um, in case of uh, uh, Axon, it's actually just a matter of changing some configuration around. And I'll show you the configuration, current configuration, a little bit as well. Uh, another important use case for uh, CQRS, ES, and microservices is actually uh, synchronizing shared data. Okay? And this uh, deserves a little bit of an explanation. So I'll talk about what this is about. So in microservices, uh, using uh, a shared data database is an anti-pattern. Right? So, so each microservice should have uh, its own uh, data store. Now, in most cases, this works out just fine because uh, two microservices don't need to share the same bit of data. But in some cases, they will. In fact, it's, I would say, about 20 to 30% use case, that is the case, is that uh, you have two separate uh, microservices. They have their own dedicated data store, but there's some data that is shared between them, there's some con con connective element. So how do you do that? Right? You, know, you, don't, you no longer have ACID transactions right, to update that you should be able to easily update, just issue two different insert statements and an update statement, and you're all good. You can't do that anymore right? because you're, you're in microservices land now. So what do you, how do you make sure these uh, shared bits of data when you're updating in, in, in one uh, web service is actually up to date in, in another? So the answer is CQRS. You can apply CQRS uh, principles to this problem. What you can do is uh, each of the in each, each of the cases where data needs to be shared, that shared data can be stored as an event store, okay? Uh, as an event so store a sourced aggregate. And what you can do is each time there is a change to this data, you can simply emit an event, all right? And that event can be uh, subscribed by any uh, microservices that are interested in this in this data change. And they can just pick and choose the parts of the data that they're interested in and update their own internal state with that shared data only. Okay? 
So this is actually a very uh, important use case for uh, beyond simply able to arbitrarily uh, using loose coupling separate out your microservices using CQRS and yes, this is actually another important use case. Even if you didn't go that route, and for example, you're using RESTful services as opposed to events to uh, to write your uh, microservices is still a case where you would want to think about applying CQRS. Okay. So uh, where I want to f uh, uh, finish off is uh, you should do all of this wisely. All right. So uh, hopefully uh, you know uh, you've seen that these are useful techniques, but they're not very simple. Right? So you, you, in the least, you need a different way of thinking about solving the same problem. Um, but uh, you know they are they do have valuable use cases, right? regardless. Uh, these are patterns; they're not architectures. This is another thing that I usually say. Um, just because you do secure CS, it's very rare that you, there's an application where every single entity needs to be event sourced. There may be some some applications out there that are like that, but that's often not the case. It's a, it's usually a subset of your application, the subset of your data that has a CQRS ES problem, and that's where you should apply it, not throughout the application. Um, there's definitely some patterns that we've observed in terms of types of applications and types of uh, types of uh, businesses where CQRS and ES is a good fit. So some examples are again. Uh, things like finance, accounting, healthcare, gaming, logistics, any kind of reservation systems, um, some e-commerce systems, government bodies where regulation regulation is important. These are very very strong use cases. Okay, for where in particular event sourcing and CQRS uh, apply, but that doesn't mean that's the only use case. Okay, there are other use cases. Even um, some of our key customers that don't fit this model, right? and uh, they they have still have a legitimate use case for CQRS and ES. Uh, again, there's particular use cases for microservices, why this is useful. And in, in fact, this is one of the reasons why um, sort of CQRS and ES have, are, is enjoying a, a sort of resurgence of sorts. Um, these are not new ideas, by the way. You know, CQRS and ES has, is a, a good decades old, old as patterns, but you, they, they are more in the vernacular now because of this microservices use cases. But again, keep in mind that microservices is also a free launch. Right? So just like uh, you only apply CQRS and ES in certain use cases, you would want to apply microservices in certain cases as well. Uh, so, summary, CQRS and event sourcing are useful patterns. Uh, Axon makes it very, very simple. So as as uh, I showed you 90% of the code uh, of a relatively simple application. It's not difficult. It doesn't, uh, it does not uh, uh, force you to uh, write a lot of additional code to do that. It's a relatively simple thing to do because most of the plumbing is abstracted away right, uh, in, into the Axon framework. Uh, and certainly there are uh, important use cases for microservices. Uh, I will uh, make sure you have a, uh, a handle to these, uh, these the slide deck. It contains both uh, my GitHub uh, application as well as some resources that I think you should look at. So if you wanted to learn a little bit more about CQRS, currently the best sources, uh, one by Martin Fowler, same thing for event sourcing. Uh, hopefully in a few months will actually be the best resource for this, not right this moment. We are um, writing some better literature on both of these topics, but not right this moment. Uh, obviously for Axon, the best place uh, to look at is uh, axonic.io. It has a bunch of, we have a bunch of videos, um, and obviously our documentation, and hopefully very soon some white papers and concepts uh, explaining some of these things. Uh, that I shared with you today. Okay, so uh, that's it in terms of uh, all that I want to hold you here for. Uh, if you want to look at anything more, um, I'll be happy to show you more of this application. So for example, the things that I haven't showed you uh, is the Maven configuration, um, the Spring Boot configuration, uh, the Axon configuration I haven't showed you. Uh, I haven't showed you how commands are actually issued. Uh, you've seen how commands are handled and uh, events are handled and uh, Events are issued. I didn't show you how commands are issued. So these are things I can show you, or you can take a look at it yourself. It's, I think it's relatively self-explanatory. Um, I'll take uh, sort of your hint, your your uh, direction either way. Okay, so feel free to tell me that you want to look at any of these things. I'll show you. Otherwise, uh, you know, have a good evening. Excellent. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Uh, hope, hope to see you again soon.